Good afternoon, everyone. This is April Stevens from Ohio EPA. We'll be starting our webinar in about one minute uh, to give some more folks time to, to log on. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Ohio EPA's 2023 Sustainability Conference. My name is April Stevens, and I'm with the Division of Environmental and Financial Assistance here at Ohio EPA. I will be moderating this afternoon's Federal Funding for You session, where you will learn about Ohio's efforts to capitalize on federal funding opportunities being offered under the Inflation Reduction Act. Ohio EPA's 2023 Sustainability Conference has 12 sessions over three days, Registration information and a conference agenda are located on our conference webpage, and we hope that you can join us for different additional conference sessions uh, this week. Please remember, it's never too late to sign up for the next conference session. All sessions are being recorded for you to view later. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items to help you participate in this session. On this slide, you will see an example screenshot of your attendee interface. You should see something that looks like this on your computer desktop on the right-hand side of the screen. For this presentation, you are listening in using your computer audio. If you're having sound issues or if the slides stop advancing, please try refreshing your browser. If that doesn't work, try logging off and logging back in. If you continue to have issues, please let us know by submitting a question and one of our behind the scenes team members will try to assist you. You can also submit questions to the presenters. Uh, to ask a question, click on the question mark icon on your attendee interface and type your question into the question pane. You may send your questions in at any time during the presentation. We will try our best to answer questions as they come in and during the Q&A portion of the webinar. If we don't answer your question during the Q&A, we will provide your questions to the presenters to follow up via email following today's session. You can click on the document icon on your attendee interface to, to view included handouts. One of these handouts is a PDF file of the PowerPoint presentation slides that we're using today. This session is being recorded and you will receive a link to the recording and a follow-up email along with a survey. The survey will also appear once the session ends. We value your feedback and we greatly appreciate it if you let us know how we are doing or let us know if there's anything we can do to further assist you. And with that, I'd like to introduce uh, today's presenters. Christina O'Keefe serve, serves as the Executive Director of the Ohio Air Quality Development Authority, or OAQDA. She was appointed to the position by the authority members in October of 2018. Christina is a recognized energy and air quality expert with 20 years of leadership experience at the local, state, and national levels. As Executive Director, Christina provides the strategic vision and focus in fulfilling the mission of the authority as an independent, non-regulatory state agency that provides financial and technical assistance for projects contributing to cleaner air. Prior to joining OAQDA, Christina served in leadership positions for the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission and the State of Ohio's Energy Office. She received her Bachelor's of Science degree in Natural Resources from The Ohio State University and holds various professional certifications related to economic development and finance. Jessica Kinsley is the Deputy Director of Business and Regulatory Affairs here at Ohio EPA. Jessica acts as a primary contact for regulated entities to help coordinate permitting activities within Ohio EPA, particularly for complex projects requiring multiple permits. Jessica also assists in coordinating statewide efforts related to compliance assistance and outreach. Jessica joined Ohio EPA in 2012 at the Southeast District Office in the Division of Air Pollution Control, or as we call it, DAPC. Since then, she's served the division in a multitude of roles, including the Southeast District Manager, overseeing the Statewide Permit Support Unit, the Air Quality Evaluation and Planning Unit, and the Training Coordinator for DAPC. Jessica, 
Jessica graduated from the University of Toledo with an undergraduate degree in geography and planning and received a master's of science degree from Ohio University. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Christina and Jessica. Thank you, April. We appreciate the, those introductions and we appreciate all of you joining us this afternoon to learn a little bit more about the state of Ohio and our efforts to pursue federal funding. And so for the agenda today, and I'm trying to advance to the next screen. So April, I'm already needing assistance from one of your fairies behind the scenes. <laughs> no problem, let's see. Try clicking on the screen again. There you there go. There we go, thank you very much. No problem. So for today's session, we really wanted to do an overview of the planning that's going on at the state level, um, specifically looking at federal funding in the Inflation Reduction Act. So we wanna introduce uh, what's available there. We're focusing in on competitive grant programs that are being offered through the IRA. And so you see those on the screen, the Climate Pollution Reduction Grant Program, the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, and other emerging competitive programs. Um, we're going to go a little bit into where we are in our planning process, some of our strategies, and have plenty of time for Q&A. But first, uh, many of you are most likely very familiar with the Ohio EPA. Um, some of you may or may not know my agency. So I just wanted to spend a brief moment to introduce the Ohio Air Quality Development Authority. We are an independent non-regulatory state agency that is authorized under state law, the Ohio Revised Code. I report to a bipartisan board, which consists of five members appointed by the governor in eight-year terms, and two ex officio members, which include the directors of both the Ohio EPA and the Department of Health. My agency has been around for 50, more than 50 years, and we're focused on providing financial assistance for communities and businesses uh, focused on the environmental, economic, and public health needs. Um, we primarily became in existence because of, in the early 1970s, with the Clean Air Act. And so we are definitely a partner with the business community um, and local governments to help with their compliance need when they're thinking about environmental regulations. And we've been doing that as a conduit bond issuer uh, through air quality revenue bonds, financing energy efficiency, renewable energy, uh, point source compliance projects, uh, even clean transportation projects. And we have an active portfolio of 3 billion in outstanding debt featuring hundreds of projects. And you can see the map um, basically visualizing where our investments have been across the state. And with that, I wanted to turn it over to Jessica to give you an overview of the Inflation Reduction Act. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Jessica Kinsley here with Ohio EPA. And echoing everything that Christina has said, we are so glad to be with you this afternoon to talk about these exciting opportunities that are being offered under the Inflation Reduction Act. Goodness, it seems like there is something new uh, coming out nearly every day. Uh, even from the time we put together this presentation to uh, finalizing it, I had to make a few more updates because new program guidance actually came out about a few of the programs we are discussing. So as you may or may not be aware, the Inflation Reduction Act was passed and signed just last August. And really since then, we have seen a lot of activity. It allocates north of a quarter of a trillion dollars to energy security and climate change programs that are going to be rolled out over the next 10 years. And as I said, though they're going to be rolled out over the next 10 years, in this first year, we have already seen so much movement, and I honestly anticipate even more in year two of this program. And two, to date, we have seen a lot of that funding being routed through US EPA. Again, with energy security and climate change kind of being the focus, that kind of makes sense that US EPA would be at the forefront of some of these programs. So now to get into some of the programs that we're going to be talking about today, first up, we have the Climate Pollution Reduction Grant Program, 
or the CPRG. You'll also note that most of these programs have handy little uh, acronyms that we will use. So the goal of the Climate Pollution Reduction Grant Program is to assist in the development and implementation of strong climate pollution strategies and also to reduce harmful air pollution. It's kind of interesting because this program has $5 billion set aside, but the way that US EPA is implementing it is actually a two-phased approach. The first phase is a planning phase. And for the planning program, they set aside $250 million in planning grants for states, tribal areas, and MSAs. So really kind of how that shook out is that US EPA set aside $3 million for states and $1 million for large municipal statistical areas. So for the state of Ohio, uh, we were successful in being able to raise our hand to go for that planning portion. And when it came to the MSAs, when it comes to the top 67 most uh, populous, that really shook out to mean the three C's. So Cincinnati, Cleveland, and Columbus. And then actually because a few other MSAs did not apply, Dayton was also able to get in there. So they have all been successful in applying for the $1 million planning grant. Now these planning grants are very important because eligibility for the second phase of the program which sets aside $4.6 billion in implementation, is contingent upon whether or not you are active and uh, participating in the planning portion. So by the state of Ohio raising our hand and going for the $3 million planning grant, that then opened the door for areas not covered under the four MSAs to also be eligible to hopefully apply directly for some of the implementation awards. Now, we don't necessarily know what the implementation side of this program is going to look like because US EPA has stated that late summer, early fall, we should be seeing program guidance on that. So I do anticipate that that will be coming shortly. But we are actively working on the first phase, that planning phase. So to illustrate a little bit about what I mean when I say US EPA is turning out these programs very quickly, you can kind of see the timeline that we've been working under when it comes to the planning grant for the CPRG. Program guidance was just released uh, March 1st for this uh, planning portion. They asked states to submit a notice of intent by the end of the month. And really the notice of intent was just that, saying that we are going to be the lead agency for this application. We are going to be raising our hand for the state. Uh, State of Ohio was successful in having our NOI submitted by the March 31st deadline under the signature of Governor DeWine, noting that Ohio EPA would be the lead agency for this effort in the state. Our application, complete application for this program was then due by April 28th, and we received notice of our award on June 29th. So again, a very quick turnaround uh, in a very busy time. As I mentioned, so many programs are coming out quickly uh, with tight turnaround times for these IRA programs. And it's something that the state of Ohio is taking very seriously. We are keeping a very active watch on these programs as they come out. And two, on the request for information as these programs come out, because US EPA will put out like a paragraph saying, uh, we have X amount of dollars to focus on Y area. How do you think we should implement this program? And key stakeholder engagement and collaboration has been key to try to position Ohio as best as possible to capitalize on these various programs. So hopefully you've seen a lot of uh, outreach and engagement from us when it comes to various programs at these different stages and why events like today are so important to continue to raise awareness about these efforts. A lot of the programs that we'll go through today are kind of at different phases in the planning process, but all very important to keep on the radar to again, position Ohio as best as possible moving forward. All right, so back to CPRG, sorry for that tangent. When it comes to the deliverables under the planning portion, so basically why we had to raise our hand for the $3 million planning grant and what that money is going towards, we have to develop these deliverables by these deadlines. First up is our preliminary resiliency plan. This is a new plan for the state of Ohio. 
And a key component of that is to put a robust GHG inventory, greenhouse gas inventory together, as well as reduction measures and to do a low income disadvantaged communities benefits analysis. A common thread that we've seen amongst all of these IRA programs is a strong emphasis on environmental justice and how to better serve underserved or better serve uh, disadvantaged and underserved communities. So things like the low income and disadvantaged communities benefits analysis is key to something like that. Again, harkening back to the very quick turnaround time, our preliminary resiliency plan is due by March 1st of 2024. So again, we are very uh, actively working to get that done in time since we were just awarded uh, the planning grant at the end of June. So the state of Ohio has actually worked to hire uh, a contractor, a consultant to assist us with this effort and we are actively working on that. And I would expect that you would hear more from us when it comes to the outreach component very soon. Next up is the comprehensive resiliency plan. As you could imagine, the comprehensive resiliency plan is really building upon that preliminary plan. Key components for the comprehensive plan include GHG projections and reduction targets, a full benefits analysis, and two, a leveraging of other federal funds. And we'll talk a little bit about that too with some of the programs that we're going to discuss today. That is due in mid-2025. And finally, the third deliverable under, under this program is a progress report. And that progress report is going to be due in mid-2027. So overall, we're looking at a four-year project period for the CPRG planning portion. As I mentioned at the beginning, we do expect that implementation phase to also be introduced soon. So it will be very interesting to see how those two uh, phases play together and what that's going to look like. But I do anticipate that soon we will hear more about that. And I believe with that, we've covered the CPRG. So now on to a new acronym, the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund or GGRF, and Christina's gonna take that away. Thank you, Jessica. The next set of programs that we wanted to cover in the Inflation Reduction Act is the GGRF or Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. And this is promulgated as part of the Federal Clean Air Act. The Inflation Reduction Act um, really identified 27 billion, which is one of the largest programs within the IRA. And this funding is primarily focused on providing financial assistance. Um, into three different sub-programs under the GGRF, the National Clean Investment Fund, the Clean Communities Investment Accelerator, and Solar for All. And the common themes across all these three different programs in the GGRF is looking to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and other harmful air pollutants, mobilizing private capital and leveraging other federal and state incentives, and focusing on deploying this financial assistance in low-income and disadvantaged communities. Now, all three of these programs are in active competitions. This is being administered by the US EPA, and they have solic solicitations out now for eligible recipients. And OAQDA is the lead agency applying on behalf of the Solar for All. We did submit a notice of intent under Governor DeWine's signature identifying OAQDA as that prime applicant for that program. And so we're in the throes of putting together our strategies and financial modeling for our application. In other programs, we are looking to be a partner with qualified recipients to compete in those programs. And I will talk a little bit more about that later on. But I wanted to dig a little deeper into each of these subprograms just so you appreciate some more of the focus and objectives that are identified for each. The first one is the National Clean Investment Fund. Again, 14 billion of the 27 billion is identified for this program. The US EPA is looking to identify two to three national nonprofits that can deploy capital at state and local levels in the form of financial assistance for qualified projects. And the qualified projects are really being prioritized around three main areas, 
and those include the distributed clean energy generation, energy efficient buildings focused on net zero emissions, and clean transportation such as electric vehicle infrastructure and charging. But other project types are eligible and the, the US EPA has identified six different principles laid out on what can qualify for the financial assistance um, centered around reducing harmful air pollution. So under this program, OAQDA is talking to several national nonprofits that are looking to apply and we would either be a sub-recipient of capital to attract what we can into the state for Ohio projects or be a co-investor uh, into certain projects with a national partner. The second program is the Clean Communities Investment Accelerator. And this allocates six billion for two to seven national nonprofits that will essentially serve as this hub to deploy capital down to what, are, what is being defined as community-based lenders. So if you think about credit unions, local green banks at the city or county levels, CDFIs and other public development agencies, that have the ability to lend within their community under kind of a mission-based approach of aligned with the CCIA, those are the type of recipients that are available. So at the state of Ohio, we are very supportive of as many community-based lenders within our state to participate in this funding to essentially grow the ecosystem of different lenders. And the third program is called Solar for All, and this allocates seven billion for up to 60 awards. And it's really focused on states, municipalities, and nonprofits, which are eligible to apply. Now with the identification of 60 awards, this strongly suggests that each state, territory, and tribal government within the US will receive some level of funding through this program. All of this funding must be used to benefit residential cus customers, with the deployment of solar technology to improve and benefit their household. And it can include related storage and upgrades that can, that can assist that performance of the solar technology. And additionally, 100% of this funding must be deployed in communities that are defined as low income and disadvantaged. And although this funding is competitive, the US EPA indicated that it will work cooperatively with awardees in this funding, even post-selection. So as we're working to put together our application, we are very much looking at it as part of the beginning of the process and working with the US EPA. We are looking to identify specific implementation models and strategies in the application but we expect the selection of strategic partners and local implementation partners to happen post-award um, once, and we will finalize that in cooperation with the US EPA. Now I've mentioned the focus on deploying capital in low-income and disadvantaged communities. For Ohio, we did map these geographies to identify them as we'll engage local partners for implementation and to reach those who need to benefit with this funding. And you can see every region of the state does have communities that meet this definition with a blend of both urban and rural areas. And for Solar for All, again, 100% of that funding must be deployed in these areas of Ohio, including households, whether they meet low income eligibility definitions or not. But if you're, if you have an uh, income, low income qual qualified household outside of those red areas, they can also participate in the program or affordable multifamily developments. And for the NCIF, at least 40% of that funding that flows into Ohio must be deployed into these low income or disadvantaged communities. So again, a strong emphasis on serving those in traditionally underserved communities. Now for Ohio's plan for the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, it really stems on the goal to maximize and attract as much of the federal funding resource as we can into the state to benefit Ohio projects across different sectors. 
And we really focus in on this vision of building a healthy Ohio and certain key themes of leveraging clean tech innovation and aligning that with strengthening Ohio's economic engine. We wanna achieve healthier homes and communities and really build that wealth for families who have been in these traditionally underserved communities, ensuring the benefits flow and stay uh, with those households. And the keys to success, as you can see there, we're really looking at designing a plan around strong multi-sector partnerships with the vision of achieving this market transformation. We embrace the challenge of doing long lasting program design and delivery and strengthening our efforts through our implementation partners locally. And one of the key aspects here across all of these programs is how we can take that seed capital from the federal government and mobilize and leverage private capital and public incentives. So in the next couple of slides, I just wanted to go a little deeper into these key for success because it gives you a little idea of where we're headed um, with implementation uh, when we receive federal funding. So in working with the Ohio team, we discussed the importance of inclusive collaboration across the state and within multiple sectors. And with this opportunity, we really recognize it's not just a state initiative, we're really a catalyst. Uh, to drive capital down to the local community. So not one entity can do it all. Rather, we're seeking to cultivate this ecosystem of partners at the state and local levels to represent all the voices in Ohio. And as you can see on the screen, there's a diverse set of expertise and perspectives that really must come together, whether it be local government leaders to uh, identify these funding opportunities, or creating pathways for new jobs and installers to complete the work, or lenders to lean in with their financing as we create that right blend of incentives to pull private capital to the table for projects. So we're working on developing this roadmap of this community engagement and one that can increase in capacity as this opportunity reaches full scale over the long term. And as we're working together to build out the infrastructure, we're thinking about the interconnectedness of all of those three GGRF programs, along with how we can align that with public incentives to design a framework that utilizes the strength of our local and regional networks. Now the implementation models consider this portfolio approach of investment at different levels within the state and through a variety of models that can deploy capital to benefit homeowners or communities and businesses with this funding. And in Solar for All and the National Clean Investment Fund, there will be opportunities for state level direct lending where it makes sense through OAQDA, but providing capital to augment regional and local community-based lenders, especially if we can complement that capital flowing from those same lenders through the Clean Community Investment Accelerator. And we're taking this comprehensive portfolio approach really to avoid duplication, help increase communication across the state between different networks, share best practices, and also think about the credit quality where it could be bolstered from some areas of the state versus others. And we know the greatest need, again, is going to be in those disadvantaged and traditionally underserved communities. So as noted on the slide, we really are thinking about this framework built upon developing and building a strong workforce and high quality jobs in order to make sure this available funding is utilized for projects. So that's a strong component as we think about building out our plans. And as we build out our capacity and think about the long lasting nature of the program, it's important to use that initial seed capital from the federal government and scale it. So leveraging existing federal and state incentives, including the federal direct pay tax credits, are important to subsidize projects balanced with a direct lending program that will enable the recycling of funding with a revolving loan fund. So it's that portfolio approach 
as loan repayments cycle back through the programs. And assuming there is increasing demand in the programs at the local level, in order to grow capacity of our networks, we can then explore utilizing private capital investments through the issuance of OAQDA bonds going to the capital markets to achieve the greater scale. We certainly don't want this to be a one and done program with the federal award. We really are thinking about it in the long term beyond those first generation of projects that might receive the lending and financial assistance through the GGRF. So over time, the goal is to increase the funding as the demand for clean technologies and innovation continues to grow. Um, but we're also thinking about how we can still identify and provide those grant subsidies for those who might need it most in disadvantaged and low-income communities. And as part of our planning, we're, we're mindful of different key factors that need to be considered as we're designing and administering the programs. And some of these are identified on the screen, but don't necessarily reflect all the considerations. But just to walk you through some of these, as more solar, for example, is being interconnected into the utility grid under Solar for All, the flow of that intermittent power from these systems will affect the electric utility's ability to manage the grid. And so there may be increased costs associated with managing the flow of that electricity. And so we're thinking about how we need to better study that issue and what strategies may be necessary to upgrade the electric grid. Other factors involve capacity building with lenders and implementation partners to work proactively with reaching and serving residential customers through education, but also the maintenance and operation of these systems over the long term. Workforce and supply chain could be limiting factors and we're really trying to dig deep into understanding how we can overcome some of the challenges that we're seeing there. Um, particularly once solar projects are financed, we wanna make sure they get built. And so we're thinking about exploring strategies on how we could scale up trained installers and procure the solar equipment um, at competitive prices. And certainly from your perspective and your experience, if you have any comments or insights on any of these factors or others, please reach out and let us know. Again, this process will be ongoing in the coming year and through the term of the federal award. And again, it's going to take this multi-sector collaboration as we're thinking about transforming the market here. Now, under the GGRF programs, the, Fed, the federal government has really identified certain objectives and outputs for the use of the funding. And so here's just a sampling of how we're planning to measure success across these different programs of which OAQDA and the Ohio EPA will be responsible for as a subrecipient or a direct recipient. But certainly the number of households and projects served, specifically under Solar for All, there's an, a requirement to have an average reduction of 20% in energy costs across households within a utility territory. And we're also looking at how we can support workforce development and achieve greater workers trained and employed in increasing jobs within these industries and achieving energy savings and that clean solar generation and other innovative technologies that can be deployed. And we'll be certainly looking at how we can be scaling by mobilizing private capital with the total financial assistance deployed and the strength of our implementation network with the number of partners involved. In taking those uh, outputs, we are then translating them into the de desired outcomes in the long term. So at OAQDA, we tend to look at projects that we finance through the lens of improving air quality, achieving economic prosperity, and enhancing public health. And so specific outcomes that we'll be looking to measure are is that reduction in air pollution in certain targeted sectors, reducing that average energy burden that is severe among many households, particularly those within low-income communities. And again, energy burden is the percentage of a household income that is spent on paying for energy costs. And many households have 
well above 15% or even greater of their household income spent on utilities. We're looking at the unemployment rates and making sure that areas um, within the state also um, have opportunities for job creation at, with the growth of these industries. And we also have a new tool called the social return on investment, where every dollar that's spent on financing returns societal benefits. And so that's another way that we're going to be measuring progress. And of course, the increase in more safer, cleaner, affordable housing and community is going to be a key outcome of these programs. So as we think about kind of the goals and the vision and the themes, we're now thinking about how do we actually get there? Um, so as we begin to operationalize the vision and these program models that we're developing, we're identifying these key pathways across the different sectors that we can direct this funding to reach the intended beneficiaries. So these pathways are built on data research and leverages the infrastructure and the Ohio stakeholders in order to deliver financing through our network of local and regional partners, all aligned with that eligibility of the federal funding of which then OAQDA and Ohio EPA will manage the requirements. So this table is just representative of many potential programs, targeted financial products, whether it be a grant subsidy, a low cost loan, credit enhancement, or a green bond that we're looking to design to reach and help individuals, businesses, and communities. In the lower half of the table, we're identifying the type of technical assistance required to build and scale our programs in order to overcome barriers and transform that market for improved air quality technologies. So these can include community engagement, education, workforce development, and standardizing the tools and capacity building with our local partners. And hey, next, I just wanted, yes. Quick question for you. Uh, something sure. at, and I think now might be a good time. Uh, just to talk a little bit about how rental populations may impact things and if a potential consideration for solar installation about whether it has to be done by the homeowner. Yeah, we're, we're looking at program pathways that can really benefit a residential customer, no matter if they own their home or if they're renting. And so even if they own their home, we're identifying ways of either they want to pay and install that themselves, how we can subsidize it, or if it can be through third party ownership models like a power purchase agreement or leasing um, the solar PV system on their home. Now, if you are a renter and you live, for example, in an apartment building or a multifamily uh, housing development, we're also thinking about pathways to reach and benefit those customers as well through solar and energy efficiency. And so we're talking to partners like the Ohio Housing Finance Authority and other multifamily developers of how we can incentivize solar for those installations. So we really are taking that kind of comprehensive approach. Awesome. Does that Thank help, you. Jessica? Yep, perfect. Okay, yeah, and thanks for calling out any questions from the chat that might be coming up along the way. Happy to take those. All right, so the next couple of slides, I just wanted to dig a little deeper um, into these program pathways. Of, of how we can use the federal funding. And so on these slides are just, as you can see, examples of OAQDA programs, which are well positioned and can be expanded with the federal funding. But we are also talking to local partners about their existing programs as well. And so with our research at OAQDA, we identified gaps in the market for traditional capital providers in some areas of the state and for certain types of borrowers, particularly those credit challenges. So we're exploring the addition of financial products like low-cost loans that can be added to our programs, but working with local partners be, beyond just our programs at OAQDA, we're interested in other community-based lenders and development finance agencies, local port authorities, 
which are having great success with energy efficiency programs themselves in their local communities. So we really are looking at how we can leverage these existing programs uh, to scale. Additionally, we're looking at new financial assistance that can be leveraged for existing with our existing infrastructure, with our economic development partners. One example is the extensive um, network built by Jobs Ohio and their regional network, including the Ohio Business Roundtable. So as businesses are facing increasing operational costs, higher interest rates, increased regulations, we're identifying ways to utilize this federal funding to help small and medium-sized businesses, many that, are, that serve as suppliers to larger global industries, and how we can finance energy efficiency and clean energy generation technologies. It not only lowers their operating costs, but it can help maintain their advantage or even compete for new business with globally traded companies that might have strong corporate sustainability or decarbonization goals. Another important area is local governments and community leaders and as we think about how we can deploy clean energy technologies. So with this funding, we're looking at opportunities to support local governments and community partners to maintain and create safer, healthier, more cost-effective spaces for residents. And we've been hearing from many local elected officials about the significant needs in their communities. Many are struggling with aging buildings. They have rising costs to operate critical infrastructure and modernize their facilities. And so some key requirements of the GGRF are focused on deploying community solar, aimed at benefiting residential customers, and to install energy efficiency, storage, and EV infrastructure. So as we've been having these conversations with local elected officials, we're recognizing that they are maintaining many competing priorities. And so we're looking at who can be trusted community partners in the various regions to help build out capacity and really help us with pre-development and ongoing technical assistance of these projects. And as I mentioned before, under Solar for All, that funding is really focused on the residential sector. And so as we're thinking about how to best deploy that federal funding, we're identifying the right balance of financial tools to reach and benefit these individuals. Again, whether they rent or own their home. And so the use of solar and energy efficiency is designed to lower their bills by 20% on average and again, addressing that higher energy burden with which, of which many households may have. And so the pathways do involve not only single family homes, but multifamily development as well, and how we can also reach them through community-based designed and implemented projects around solar. Now, the timeline that we're under right now is the Notice of funding opportunities by the US EPA was announced in June and July of all three programs. And they are, all of the applications are due October 12th. So we're in the phase of developing our application and preparing it for submission to the US EPA. Again, an O on applying. Solar for All, and we're partnering with national eligible nonprofits under the National Clean Energy. So right now we're actively sharing um, our vision and some of the implementation models and strategies with the idea that we can align with local partners and obtain letters of support. The US EPA has indicated that they'll provide award notices by next summer of 2024. And so that's when, once we understand where we, what level of funding we will receive, we'll be working more closely on selection and implementation to launch programs towards the end of 2024. Jessica, anything to add on the timeline and next steps? No, I think that sounds great. Just that we are uh, 
very much so actively working on this and also thankful <laughs> that we do have that year to continue to kind of build out um, the program itself. Great, and I think I turn it over to you to cover a few final programs. Yes, thank you so much for that. All right, emerging programs. So I know we have already covered a lot of information, uh, but there are two other programs that I wanna highlight because I do see these as kind of coming to the forefront. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, when from the time when I put together this presentation to the time when we were finalizing things, I had to make updates and one of those programs was actually regarding the methane emissions reduction program. Uh, the methane emi emissions reduction program actually sets aside $1.5 billion uh, to help reduce methane emissions through financial assistance targeting the oil and gas industry. That's another key component that I have seen uh, threaded amongst all of these programs too is that US EPA does acknowledge and understand the need for strong technical assistance when it comes to deployment of these various programs. And that is something that I'm thankful that they are considering. We do know that when it comes to the methane emissions reduction program, US EPA is also partnering with the Department of Energy. And just last month, August 28th, I believe it was, they came out with the first facet of this program. And the first facet of this program is really, really targeting marginal conventional wells. And it sets aside $350 million in grants to conduct uh, monitoring at these smaller producing wells and actually to uh, shut down some of these smaller producing wells. And again, too, technical assistance is a component that was noted in this. As I said, they have set aside $350 million for this program. And the way that they set aside the funding was a formula allocation actually based on the amount of marginal conventional wells per state. And the way that that shook out, I think Ohio was seventh on the list. Uh, it sets aside $15.1 million for the state. So as I mentioned before, as we've seen with other programs, US EPA again has a very tight turnaround time. They just announced this program August 28th Originally, the application was due September 30th. They have uh, generously given us 10 additional days, so the application is now due on October 10th. So this is one of the grant programs that is a high priority for me right now that I am actively reviewing this and we're working closely together with our partners at the Ohio Department of Natural Resources to again see where might this program fit here in the state of Ohio. So I do anticipate more information on that coming soon, but that is exciting. And like I said, that $350 million program is just the one facet of the $1.5 billion set aside for the Methane Emissions Reduction Grant Program. The second emerging program that I also wanna highlight is transportation programs. US EPA has noted that there's $4 billion set aside to reduce emissions from the transportation sector. One billion has been set aside for clean heavy duty vehicles and three billion has been set aside for clean port technology. To date, we have seen a few requests for information come out from US EPA regarding these programs, but no actual formal guidance. US EPA keeps teasing that more to come, there will be more to come soon on these programs. So I would think that sometime, maybe this coming winter, we might see how that looks. Uh, the second request for information that they sent out was more technical in nature. So I do think that this transportation program one will have the eligibility for uh, entities to directly apply it themselves. So, private um, businesses may be able to kind of raise their hand when it comes to clean heavy duty vehicles and clean port technology. And with that, I think it covers everything that we had scheduled, but I think we might have some time for questions as well. So I can turn it back over to April. Yes, thank you both, Christina and Jessica. Uh, that was a great presentation. We do have some time for questions and we've had some come in. Um, 
So um, we will get started with those in one sec. As a reminder, if you can still submit questions through the questions pane, um, we'll do our best to answer them um, today as they come in during this session. Um, we won't be able to do them all uh, uh, live, but um, hopefully we're answering them behind the scenes. And then we will also um, get your questions to the presenters afterwards if we can't get them answered during the session and they can follow up with you via email. Um, so let's see, let's start here. Um, I know earlier you both mentioned, I know Christine, at least you mentioned that, um, you know, these, these low income, designated low income and disadvantaged communities, um, that's part of this infrastructure um, for Jobs Act. If, if the entities aren't in those designated areas, can they still participate in the programs? So I think that's something that we kind of have to look at and on an individual program by program basis. Now, when it comes to how we're defining uh, disadvantaged or underserved communities, that's also something that we have seen each program kind of providing additional input on what parameters are being considered. But overall, I will say that in the state of Ohio, when we have looked at the programs that have kind of specified how to define those areas, there is a great area across the state that is eligible. So that's something that's important to note too, and ways that we can kind of work together. And two, if you are a local uh, municipality, if you ever have a question about that, um, please feel free to reach out to either myself or Christina. One tool that USCPA has really been emphasizing is the EJ screen tool as well. So that's something that we have become more versed in and EJ screen analyses are something that we're incorporating into a lot of applications um, and to kind of across the board. So hopefully that addressed that question. Great, thanks Jessica. Um, what about Christina, do you think, can you give us an example of a project or a case study that might kind of bring some of these programs kind of, you know, you know, to life as far as, you know, the kind of things that can be done with this funding? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think I covered earlier, you know, a project example around a, a, a household installing solar on their home. Um, but we're also thinking about other sectors like a small business owner, um, someone who might be having rising utility bills, energy costs are going up um, with electric rates. And so what can they do to manage their costs more effectively? So in thinking about how to best reach them, either it's through their local government um, or economic development professionals, you know, think about it as a retention and expansion opportunity from that perspective, but talking to, a, you know, a small business owner and what are the energy efficiency improvements that you can make in their building, you know, more efficient lighting, more efficient windows, you know, better insulation, um, we can help then finance that with below market rates on a loan, for example, um, pair that with, and as we can, other state and federal incentives to lower the, the upfront costs for that small business owner, but then pay back that debt service over time through the savings, the energy savings that exist from what they otherwise were, would be paying for their utility bills. But that's just one example, um, but there's many ways that we can basically replicate that same example across different sectors. Great, and that kind of leads into another question that we had gotten um, earlier in the presentation. Someone was kind of wanting a little bit more help with the, like, the translation of how the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund programs that you'd mentioned would build wealth for Ohio families. Um, so kind of just reiterating what kind of what you went over, how that was, you know, kind of kind of offset energy costs. But would you want to relab elaborate a little bit more on, you know, that that wealth creation and how that's going to be tied from these funds? Yeah, that's that's a great question. And, and it depends on how what perspective you take on it. It's certainly, you know, from the end user, you know, that residential household or the small business owner, how we can lower their energy costs, which then, you know, leaves a little bit extra in a month to pay for something else, you know, for that household or that small business. Um, but part of the design of the program overall is to keep the capital flowing within these communities. 
um, many times financial programs might have partners involved who don't live in the state. So, you know, the flow of funds might actually go out of these communities. And so by design, we're thinking about local implementation and local community-based lenders, where if a loan or a grant subsidy is made, it's between within that community. And so as a loan is being repaid back, you know, that goes to a local community-based lender who can then loan it out to somebody else in that community. And then OAQDA, we're here to help augment that over time to replenish funds, leveraging private capital to then flow that back into the community. So in, instead of having this extractive kind of process that may happen, we're intentionally trying to keep it as a closed system, if you will, April, to recycle that funding within these communities. Um, so that's some of the idea there of how we can retain wealth, um, not only at, at a business or, you know, household level, but within the community itself. Right, and that's such a great sustainable model, too, to just, you know, keep the money continuing to flow in the community. Uh, so that's wonderful. Um, I know we're getting a little short on time. We've got a lot of great questions coming in. Again, um, it, I think we just have time for one more question. So the rest of these, again, we will, um, Christina and Jessica will get a, a report of all the questions that you guys submitted during this session, and they'll be able to reach out to you, um, you know, after the session via email to answer those questions. And we really appreciate all of the engagement and all the comments that you've been submitting. Um, so one last one, just to kind of wrap this all up. So I know you're working right now to submit all the applications. Um, what are the next steps for the pro program design and implementation? What can we expect to see next? So I can go first uh, when it comes to the Climate Pollution Reduction Grant Program. As I mentioned before, we are actively working on getting those deliverables developed at this point in time. And a key component of that is outreach and engagement. Uh, collaboration is really going to be key to success as we're developing these plans for the first time for the state of Ohio. So as I noted, we are working with consultant to kind of develop an outreach strategy. So I would suggest that if you're interested in that and participating, please shoot me an email. Uh, you can see my email right there on the screen and we can be sure to keep you informed on our progress as we're working towards that. Um, but definitely if you see opportunities like that, please participate, we want to hear from you. Um, and that's something that our director, Ann Vogel, is, uh, she has a strong emphasis on collaboration and proactive engagement. So please participate in any of these uh, events that you can. And I think that's next for the CPRG and for the other programs too, keeping an active watch on it, the methane one, we're actively evaluating who should be the lead when it comes to that program here in the state of Ohio, and then awaiting uh, new guidance each and every day on these other programs too. And Christina? Yeah, I would just add on the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, um, one of the key factors for our success is strength and partnership. So that's demonstrated through letters of support. So if anybody on the line um, is interested in providing a letter of support from your organization, your local community, please reach out by email to us. It's not too late uh, to uh, join in on that effort. Um, and then post application submission, we're gonna continue to be working on capacity building and program design with the anticipation of federal awards um, by next summer. And then we'll definitely utilize that up to a year of planning um, given by the US EPA uh, before we launch. So we'll definitely need to work with our partners in finalizing the details. But if you're interested, please reach out. We wanna hear from you. Um, it's, we're, we're recognizing it's taking multiple different types of perspective and experiences to strengthen what we can deliver here in Ohio. Wonderful. Well, thank you both so much um, for the great presentation. Um, and thank you all for joining us today. Uh, the webinar has been recorded and you will receive an email um, after this with a link uh, to the recording and a link to the session survey. Um, but before I end today, um, I just want to remind you of our upcoming sessions uh, for the 2023 Sustainability Conference. Um, the next one, and hold on, let me advance the screen here really quick. There we go. Thank you, Travis. Um, we have one more today. Uh, we are not done today. The fourth uh, session today is um, Feeding People, Not Landfills. It's Food Waste Reduction and Diversion. And in that ses session, attendees are going to learn about 
food waste reduction and diversion solutions and techniques um, from a diverse panel of experts ranging from reallocation of edible foods to composting what's left. Um, and then tomorrow we're back for another full day of sessions. There'll be four more sessions tomorrow. So please check out that list um, on the conference website and hopefully we'll see you all um, later this afternoon and tomorrow. And then uh, before we end the session today, just want to give another plug for our Recycle Ohio um, grant program. Um, this is our annual recycling grant um, and it supports communities, nonprofits, businesses, and schools um, to do things like initiate or expand recycling programs, encourage sustainable practices, um, stimulate economic growth, and support litter prevention. Um, so uh, this just opens in a little less than two weeks on October 2nd. Uh, the application will be open for about two months, uh, closes on December 1st. If you have any questions about the Recycle Ohio grant, you can um, visit recycleohio.gov for more information. And then finally, once you leave, you will receive a survey or a link to a survey. We do value your feedback and we greatly appreciate if you let us know how we're doing and let us know if there's anything else we can further assist you with. Um, you will also receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours um, that has links to um, the recording of today's session, um, a certificate of attendance, and then another link to that survey if you don't get a chance to complete it when, you, when uh, the webinar ends. Um, and with that, we will end today's session, um, this session of the Sustainability Conference. We hope you can join us um, for more conference sessions. Um, thanks again for joining and have a great day.